The common impression is that it is the unintelligent who believe in miracles, but the fact is that it is the great minds who believe fervently in unforeseen possibilities. Our focus today is the miracle of Jesus feeding the crowds. The story represents for me one of the truest miracles. The experience of my ministry is the experience of the miracle of the feeding crowd on repeat. I know that the miracle is real. I know that it is possible. I know that it is an unforeseen possibility. More about this later. Last week, Doug Bannerman preached a meditation on possibility. It is with this in mind that I offered the opening quote from Harry Forsdick. Harry Forsdick was a Baptist pastor serving in the 1920s and 30s. He was one of the early preachers to challenge fundamentalism. Fundamentalism means a literal interpretation of the Bible. So, for example, in May 1922, Harvey preached a sermon entitled, Shall the Fundamentalists Win? The provocative sermon signaled the public conflict between historic Christianity and modern liberalism. Liberalism means that modern science, ethics, and reason are applied to understanding scripture above doctrine. Harry Forsdick adopted modernist ways of understanding scripture. So noting his anti-fundamentalist stance, noting his anti-literalist way of reading scripture, the following quote is compelling. The common impression is that it is the unintelligent who believe in miracles, but the fact is that it is the great minds who believe most fervently in unforeseen possibilities. Unforeseen possibilities. Could this be the lens through which John 6 could be understood? Now, all four Gospels relate the story of the feeding of the crowds in the wilderness. While only Luke offers the story of the lost son and the lost sheep, and only John offers the miracle of turning water into wine and the raising of Lazarus. Only in Mark do we have the teaching that the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. The story of the feeding of the multitude is different. It appears six times in all the Gospels. And clearly the story is of primal significance to the early followers of Jesus, and the first community of disciples. So from a literary point of view, the feeding of the multitude is a variation of Old Testament themes. And so for me, scripture can be compared to another passion of mine, namely playing pibroch. So pibroch is a classical form of bagpipe music. It's about a 10 minute tune. And the way it works is this. There is an opening movement called the urla or the ground, and this is the basic theme for the whole tune. There are four or five other movements that follow on, or four or five other parts to the music, and all of these other parts are variations of the ground movement. They're all variations of the urla. So, for example, you'd have the Krunlur movement and the Tula movement, but they all pick up the theme of the urla, the ground movement. And similarly, Scripture is like a pibroch. There's the ground movement, the urla, and the rest of scripture is turla or krunla, various movements that are variations of the opening theme. So in my view, the urla, the ground movement, the opening theme is in Genesis 18. Here our spiritual ancestors Abraham and Sarah offer three wanderers, three guests, who in the Eastern Orthodox Church become the triune God. Abraham and Sarah offer them a feast in the wilderness. And this desert hospitality is a product of the harsh desert landscape in which the story is contextualized. For Abraham and Sarah to refuse refreshment and sustenance to these wandering strangers is to allow them to die. A tiny comparison can be made 
to living in Western Australia, certainly in the remote areas. There was news of a chap who got lost in one of the forests near where we lived, and it was only three days later that another car, car came past. So the point is this, if you're in the rural parts of Western Australia and someone is stranded on the side of the road, you stop and help because you might be the only car that will pass for another four days. To ignore hospitality is to allow the person to die. So this hospitality is transformation. We transform and are transformed. In the hospitality that Abraham and Sarah offered the three strangers, a transformation occurred. They were transformed from stranger to guest, and they were transformed from guest to friend. So variations of this hospitality in the wilderness theme are scattered throughout scripture. A key variation of the hospitality in the desert theme is certainly the manna story in Exodus. In Exodus, Miriam and Moses lead runaway slaves to freedom through a desert and they feast on manna. In other variations of hospitality, Elijah is fed sustenance first by an angel when he's running away from Jezebel who wants to kill him and later by a group of ravens, a murder of ravens. Is it? Yeah, a murder of ravens. Elijah, in turn, offers manna to a widow and her son when there is famine in the land. Similarly, in our Old Testament story today, Elisha feeds manna, as described in 2 Kings. So John chapter 6, verse 1 to 21, a clear reference is made to Passover. And this is a feast and festival that remembers the exodus from Egypt when Miriam and Moses led the slaves to freedom in a promised land. The reference to Passover makes clear that Jesus is the new Moses offering a new exodus from slavery to freedom. And so John chapter one, John chapter six, verse one to 21, has some of the political edge in Mark's version of the story. In Mark chapter six and Mark chapter eight, the feast Jesus offers when crowds are fed bread and fish, is contrasted by the banquets Herod offers. In Jesus' feast, several baskets of bread and fish are left over. In Herod's banquet, nothing is left over except death and destruction. Similarly, in John 6, Jesus withdraws before they can make him king by force. So in all the Gospels, the possibility of the crowds being fed manna, the possibility of them being an army under Jesus, is strongly intimated. As the miracle of feeding happened in Genesis 18, with Abraham and Sarah feeding the triune God, in Exodus 16, when God feeds the runaway slaves, and in 1 and 2 Kings, in the lives of Elijah, and Elisha, and in the work of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so too can it happen in our lives. None of the Gospels explain how the miracle happened. All are clear that some miracle did happen. All the Gospels tell us is that they started off with very little, but somehow the little became more than enough. It was an abundance with plenty to spare. Some believe that Jesus, empowered by the Spirit of God, miraculously undid science and expanded the bread and fish until there was more enough to share. Others believe that the story in John 6 is a miracle of shared generosity. The interpretation is that the crowds witnessed a young boy sharing his lunch and were inspired to do the same until there was an abundance. So nobody knows quite how these miracles happened. They just know that they happened. On the face of it, the situation must have felt hopeless and the boys offering silly. There is a huge crowd. It is a wilderness setting. It's dark. There are no markets nearby and if they were, they would be closed. And the crowd is hungry. 
The price tag for a decent feed is overwhelmingly huge. A young boy offers two barley loaves and five fish. It must have seemed a silly offering, an offering that would hardly make a dent in one boy's hunger, let alone a multitude. I consider myself an authority on this. I have two young boys who each eat a portion for a normal family of four every meal. Two loaves and five fish is a snack. It's not even a starter for a young lad. But the truth is, I've experienced so many miracles like the one recorded in John 6. I honestly don't know how it happened, but I know that it did. The problems were overwhelming and seemingly insurmountable. The little that I could offer seemed silly, insignificant and insufficient, like two loaves and five fish. Yet I left every time with an abundance. Unforeseen possibilities? Absolutely. There are hundreds of examples that I could offer, but here I share two. When I was in Johannesburg, I was an HIV AIDS activist and partnered with an amazing group of women in Orange Farm. So Orange Farm is an informal settlement south of Johannesburg. Most of the people live in shacks. There are few roads, no electricity, and run, running water is by, shared, by means of a shared tap that a whole neighborhood would have access to. So one of my visits to Orange Farm, I became aware of child-headed households. Parents had died because of HIV and AIDS, and older siblings were left to care for a family, usually of four or five younger siblings. Hunger and poverty are standard problems in South Africa. There is no, so there is no social welfare. There is no Centrelink. Many of these children were not even documented. There were no birth certificates or identity documents. As far as I knew, I would be the only person belonging to any institution that knew about these children. And without knowing how I was going to make it happen, I made a commitment to provide food monthly for the child-headed households in Extension 1, the area of Orange Farm in which my new friends lived. So I offered my two barley loaves and five fish, begged for help from my darling church, and that from that month onwards, kids had a grocery hamper to see them through each month. The early months were a nightmare as my idealistic intentions were not matched with the necessary admin and management processes. Yet, and I don't know how it happened, people, businesses, schools and organisations came on board. The local grocery store packed the boxes and provided a delivery truck and a driver to take me to Orange Farm. My two loaves and five fish were multiplied to feed a multitude. Another story. The women in Orange Farm I was working with were worried about these teenagers who headed these child-headed households. You see, they had dropped out of school to look after younger siblings. Now, one of these women used her last paycheck about $50 to purchase recycled iron and wood to build a shack that would serve as a kindy so that the older children could leave their younger siblings in safety while they continued their schooling. Eventually, the shack was added onto. I was very moved by this and spoke of the story to others. Again, and I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but in the picture, you see the school that was built to support the education of the children aged zero to six. The point being made is this, is that although we may be in a wilderness and there is nothing around, although the problems we face may seem insurmountable, and our available resources insufficient and insignificant, we are asked, nevertheless, to offer what we have, 
even if it is as meager as small fish and two pieces of bread. We offer the hospitality we can in love. We allow it to be blessed, acknowledging that it came as bread from heaven anyway. We happily break it, for only broken things can be shared. And we distribute our offering confidently, knowing that our generosity and hospitality is transformed, even if we don't know how. So what is your wilderness? And what is your hungry and desperate multitude? And what bread or fish can you offer? Perhaps climate catastrophe keeps you awake at night, hungry as a multitude in a desert. Offer what you can with love. Give it to God to be blessed, for it is bread from heaven. And keep doing the little you can, knowing that an abundance consists of many tiny offerings. Perhaps your wilderness hunger is mental illness and the darkness seems insurmountable and your energy insufficient. Well, what is the little you can offer? Perhaps it is only getting out of bed and having a shower. Offer the little you can with love and offer it for blessing, for that energy is bred from heaven and trust that somehow the abundance will follow. Nobody knows how or when, but the pattern of the universe is that the abundance follows. So I end with a quote from Barbara Brown. What makes something bred from heaven? Is it the thing itself or the one who sends it? How you answer these questions has a lot to do with how you sense God's presence in your life. If you are willing to look at everything that comes to you as coming to you from God, then there will be no end to the manner in your life. Nothing will be too ordinary or too transitory to remind you of God. The miracle is that God is always sending us something to eat. God gives us the true bread from heaven, the bread that gives life to the world.